Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. I'm Ashley with Perfection Learning. Uh, we will start the presentation shortly, but for now, please drop your name and where you're from in the chat. Um, as a reminder, a recording of tonight's webinar and the presentation deck will be sent to you in an email. Um, that email uh, might not be coming until Monday, um, but be on the lookout for that. Um, please direct all questions to Brandon in the chat, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and with all that, I'll pass the presentation to you, Brandon. Great, Ashley. Thank you. And uh, I know we'll have a, a few more people joining here and there. Um, this webinar was originally uh, scheduled for earlier in the fall, and uh, we had to make some changes in and uh, things to that. Uh, so we want to make sure that um, we respect people's time. Um, but we were expecting a smallish group today, and, and that's totally, totally fine with me uh, to, to spend some time thinking about what is a very important topic. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I want everybody to know here that this will be interactive too, and so you'll get an opportunity to ask some questions uh, to toss some things my way um, as we work through this. Uh, so you should be able to see my screen now. I'm going to go ahead and run that as a slideshow. All right, so as Ashley asked you, if you would uh, drop in the chat, uh, go ahead and find that chat and uh, drop in your name, where you are, I'm uh, sorry, your name and your experience and how long you've been teaching, uh, where you are, your location. I just, it's nice to see uh, where people are around the country and around the world. And then uh, finally, I'd like to know your favorite thing about fall. It is fall here in the States, and I know sometimes we get people joining us from the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so if you want to share your favorite thing about hmm, spring, good for you, you could share that here as well. So we'll give it just a few minutes while some more people join, and we have opportunities for people to share. All right. So um, this is uh, th this webinar is just going to take a few minutes. Uh, sorry, just take about an hour. I've been on vacation this week, so you'll forgive me. I'm not top of my game right now as far as speaking, um, but I promise everything that uh, is in the presentation, I put a, a lot of time and, and thinking into. Um, we are going to spend some time thinking about things that secondary teachers may not feel like they have to spend a whole lot of time on. Um, and I'm talking middle and secondary teachers. Um, and you'll see that here as we lay out our agenda. Uh, some welcomes and some introductions. Uh, Ashley's already introduced me. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and my background in just a moment. Um, the science of reading and transitional literacy. I want to talk a little bit about that and what we mean by those things. Um, then we're going to break out and look at a text, spend some time with a, with a text for middle grades and early high school, early secondary. Um, then as we will transition at the end to thinking about how do we keep these things automatic and strategic? How do we build towards these things with these approaches? Uh, and then of course, at the end, we'll have time for some questions, comments, and ideas. Now, I know that there are people on the call here who also have lots of experience coaching and working with teachers. That is fantastic. I'm so excited uh, to see that. And so I would love for you all to give some feedback based on your all's experiences and uh, what you're observing. Um, so feel free to do that. Uh, just uh, let's make sure we don't say any names. I know nobody would do that on purpose, but sometimes things just slip out. All right. So I see Ryan has introduced himself. Ryan, it's good to see you again uh, or, or see you in the chat again. I hope all's going well in Vitalia. Uh So thanks for introducing yourself. And uh, it is 99 degrees where you are right now, Ryan. I see that. So falls in a holding pattern for you. And yeah, I've, I've saw that you all are getting quite a heat wave out there. So uh, thanks for dropping all that into the chat. All right. So uh, a lot of you know me, uh, but if, if you don't know me, um, you know my name anyway, and uh, as Ashley has just introduced me, um, my background is in 6 through 12 schools. Uh, I've taught 6 through 12. I was, I was a, trained as an administrator and did some work with that in, uh, in secondary schools, um, and I spent time uh, directing the advanced placement English programs for the college board, um, and during that time, I also spent a lot of time thinking and working with pre-AP 
courses and pre-AP materials, pre-AP units. So did a lot of time thinking about what it took for middle and high school kids to build toward that. Um, but I've also developed a lot of interest in the instruction we provide for, for kids around literacy in general in the middle and high school grades, mainly because I've seen so many kids who have such interest and such curiosity and such potential who, for some reason, reading or texts are a barrier. And maybe it's because they are English language learners. Maybe it is because they come from an, a non-literate, for whatever reason, background, uh, whether it be their own home or their family, or they come from a, uh, a situation where they've been fostered and they haven't had that, uh, that support, that continuity of support um, that you is so important coming from families and caregivers, uh, when it, especially when it comes to reading and writing. Um, and so those things really fascinated me. And when I started doing more reading several years ago about the science of reading, and things that were coming out uh, regarding the reading rope and other approaches to reading, uh, it really got me thinking a lot about the role of those sorts of things in middle and secondary ELA. And then it hit me one day, I was having a conversation with someone and it hit me that one of the problems is that most middle and high school teachers, and I, I said most, I'd say the vast majority of them which is a little bit of a cliche term, but I think you all know what I'm saying, ha have not been trained in literacy. They don't, they may have taken a class in teaching novels or teaching texts or teaching young adult novels or the young adult novel. Maybe they took a course on adolescent literacy and maybe they did get some background in that, but as far as being asked to use and apply those things to the setting in which they're teaching, uh, they don't get a lot of experience with that. And so one of the phrases that has developed for me with this is something I've used before with other things, but it comes as, it's not your fault, but it is your problem. And so in thinking about that, I like to look at some of the instructional activities that are already happening that we know are effective in classrooms, in middle and high school classrooms, and say, hey, this already fits the bill. This already ties into a lot of what's expected with the science of reading. Maybe if we just make those things a little bit more intentional, a little bit more strategic, then we can have much more of an effect size. So that's where we are with this. That's how I've come to this. Uh, and I see a hand already popping up here. Let me see here. Uh, maybe, nope, maybe, maybe not. Um, in fact, somebody maybe accidentally raised their hand, but uh, all right. And I see it, uh, one or two other people have uh, introduced some information in the chat. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Um, two big books that I strongly recommend. Uh, one is, a lot of you may already know about. Uh, another one is brand new. I just happened to get my hands on it and be able to read it a little early. Um, but uh, two great texts, uh, Teaching Literature in the Context of Literacy Instruction. Now, that's great. Um because it, it, yes, it's about teaching literature. However, it's also about, uh, it gives lots of frameworks for how you can approach literacy instruction outside of the primary and, and elementary grades. Uh, so I encourage that book. It's a pretty good one. Um, and then this new one, I really enjoyed this. Uh, it seems like it only touches on one key aspect of literacy that we're going to talk about. Uh, with the idea of background knowledge, but it really does more than that. And I really appreciate um, Kelly Gallagher and the work he does and how he's really taking the things that he's already done uh, in some ways and rethinking them, reconceptualizing them in terms of, of literacy instruction. And that's what's happening here in this book. So I encourage you to check those out. I have the, um, uh, the citations there. And at the end of this PowerPoint slide that you will get access to, um, yes, thank you for that. A uh, note. Um, both are fabulous authors. Yes, I actually had a conversation with Jennifer Ehlers, who put that uh, comment in the chat last week. Um, it, it just coincidentally, it came up uh, that that's such a good book. Um, so thank you for mentioning that, Jennifer. Uh, I, as I was saying, I do have at the very end of this a, a works cited slide. You can reference all of the uh, articles and websites that I've used uh, to build this. So let's talk very briefly about what these things mean so we can all level set and, and establish a base understanding. So you may have heard this term, the science of reading. 
Um, maybe you've, you're in a district where uh, you hear leadership talking about it, or you have heard elementary teachers, or uh, you're reading support specialists talking about it. Awesome. Right. As it says here, the science of reading encompasses a full comprehensive body of research. So it's not just one person's flash in the pan to trendy research. Okay, this is a lot of different research feeding into this, similar to John Hattie's work on uh, effect sizes for instruction, uh, visible learning, if you're familiar, which is also referenced here. About how people learn to read and, and how they continue to develop and improve reading skills. And that second set of bold face, that second bold face phrase is where most of this session is going to live. All right. But it's important that we all know that this includes findings from cognitive psychology, linguistics, and education that inform these best practices. Because we're going to look at cognitive psychology and things uh, as it relates here in just a moment, because it helps us think about our kids, and the kids we're teaching, and what they're ready for, and what we can probably do to push them and challenge them. Transitional literacy is an aspect of the science of reading. But I'm grabbing onto transitional literacy as it talks about bridging the gap, as it says here, between the basic reading skills and the more advanced liter literacy skills necessary for success in middle school, high school, and life. And then I'm thinking a lot about what that requires of teachers. And like I said earlier, a lot of teachers are already doing things like this, they, and they see it as effective. They may just not know why or how it's being effective. Okay, because this stage requires teachers to model and provide opportunities for students to apply and build on those foundational skills. So better understanding of what's happening in the grades below them, we know, especially those of us who are curriculum people, we know that vertical development of students is more guaranteed when we have vertical alignment of teachers and teachers are better understanding what's happening below them. And so a lot of this is, is key to what we're going to talk about today, too. So this is the visual that you may have seen before. And this is Scarborough's Reading Rope. Now, this is not my picture or design. I like this one because it does give a direct reference to the original source right here and the website. But imagine each of these parts of language comprehension and word recognition as a strand and how they weave together and then are woven together into an even more complex rope. Now, I really think this is an effective visual metaphor for what's happening in the brain when we learn to read and not just learn to read, but when we continue developing our reading. So I worked very closely with a high school, I continue to work very closely with this high school. It's a high school in Texas. And they are, I started working with AP, their junior and senior teachers. And now we're working six through 12 with them. And uh, we've brought in the reading specialists as part of the work that we're doing very intentionally. Um, we already had the special ed teachers in there with us, uh, the collaborating teachers, but we've also brought in reading specialists uh, for things like this because we really want people who have a foundational understanding of these individual strands and how they react to and feed into one another. But you'll see that I've added some brackets and some colors to these because the green here is showing most early literacy teaching relates to these. I remember coming up in the phonics age. You may have come up in phonics, you may not have come up in phonics. Maybe you came up in the whole language phase, whatever. Uh, you and and there are there are key differences. These things matter. Sometimes we find out things work really well. Sometimes we think out things we think work well didn't work well. But a lot of the things are. It's a situation where there's nothing new under the sun. Sometimes, not always. Sometimes. All right. So. Phonological awareness, where students learn certain aspects about syllables and words. Phonemes, this is where we're getting that research into linguistics and things, where students start learning that 
Uh, when two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking is something I remember from phonics. But that's not always true. And, and I know that. But in many cases, it is. And it is a trick to help students learn how to read uh, as they learn to decode language. Which is, has been shown through lots of research to be the most effective way of learning to read is through phonological awareness and decoding that comes with that. And then sight words. Simply memori simple memorization of sight words, familiar words, common words that lots of teachers work with. My own children worked with them uh, immediately starting in kindergarten. I remember the schools did that. They had their sight words, uh, and eventually that morphs into other things that we might call vocabulary. But now you see this, this purple or, or pink or whatever you want to call it is related to language, language comprehension. And the thinking here is, is that these are a little bit later. And we'll talk about how much later and how that relates to what a middle or secondary teacher might be doing here in just a moment. But these are the things really that I'm going to want my middle school and high school teachers to think a lot about. Now, when I have reading specialists and we have students who come in who are struggling as readers for whatever reason, reason those reading specialists are trained and are really good with administering certain assessments to see where kids are struggling and they can pinpoint the strand where students are struggling the most. And, and reading, reading specialists are, are trained to then design certain interventions to meet students where they are and accelerate those things. Fantastic. That, that is not something that we, that I am advocating happen at the classroom teacher level. We'll talk about tiered interventions and things here in just a moment if we think about MTSS. Um, but I'm not advocating that we get that discrete a level of intervention for reading at the teacher level. But I do think teachers need to be aware of it, need to see how their instruction relates to all of those things. So the goal here, as you see with these arrows, is that they are increasingly automatic and increasingly strategic. And so we can't ignore the differences between those two. Increasingly automatic being the kids don't even have to think about it. They see the word, they know what it means, and they don't have to stop and think about it. Whereas when they're a little bit older and they're continuing to build on these literacies, it may not be automatic, but they have certain strategies that they can apply. They have certain things they can do to engage a text, to approach a text. And these strategies, the things that we're asking kids to practice in our classroom, the activities we're giving them, sometimes the questions we're asking them, they all fall within these five strands under language comprehension. And we'll see an, an example of that here in just a moment. But whether it is a seventh grade student who is struggling to understand what is happening in a book because he or she does not understand the, the world of that book, the context of that book, where the teacher might have to provide some more background knowledge or help the student learn to seek out that background knowledge themselves, or it's an AP literature senior who is reading this text and they understand what's happening in the text, but they're struggling to understand how what's happening in the text has a larger meaning or a thematic meaning where we get into verbal reasoning. All of the things we are probably already doing in our classroom fall within language and comprehension here. So let's talk a little bit about some assumptions here because transitional liter literacy does not, sorry, transitional literacy does not assume skills. Now here's what I mean by that headline. Traditional literacy comes from a place that kids maybe need a little bit of instruction on certain reading skills and certain ways to approach reading. And they need modeling of that. They need support in that. And then they need teacher design, expert design, because the teacher as an expert reader, teacher designed, expert designed approaches to a text so that the student can get into the text, engage the text effectively. So one of the key assumptions here is that it's not teaching texts, it's using texts to teach. Like I've said a couple of times already, and you'll hear me say again, most instruction already involves these things. 
teachers must be explicit about what the student is doing and why they're doing it. And the relationship between the what and the why and the relationship between the different parts of the language comprehension strands here. And then students must, must practice transferring skills to new texts. Without transfer, teaching is a waste of time. Without asking students to take what they have learned to do when they read, or how to think when they read, or how to think about something when they read, without asking to transfer that to a new text, then we're essentially just teaching the text. We come back full circle. And we're not teaching texts. We're teaching, we're using texts to teach. And then we are building toward automatic and strategic. So I talked earlier about the foundations of the science of reading, one of them being cognitive psychology and developmental psychology. In Hattie's very popular book, Visible Learning, which I'm, I think many of you are familiar with, um, and Chris, I see your question there about verbal fluency. I'll talk about it in just a moment. Thanks for bringing that up. If I forget, ping me. Make sure, hold me, hold my feet to the fire. Make sure I come back to that. Um, if you're familiar with Hattie's book, great. If you're not familiar, just a, a brief touch. Uh, what Hattie and his research team did was went into lots of classrooms, observed different uh, strategies being applied in classrooms in different ways. They categorized all these different strategies and these different approaches and looked at what mattered most. And they used different ways of determining uh, student growth and student development. Uh, you can get into the book and look at the, the research processes. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, but the number one, as the headline here on the slide says, teaching strategies that accounted for Piaget, right, the uh, levels of cognitive development that we'll see more here in just a moment, have the highest effect size of any teaching approaches. All right, so I'm not going to get all into that, but uh, you need to know that this the, the difference that Piaget and strategy, strategies in a classroom that we're thinking about where students are cognitively, what students should be able to comfortably do, how we can push students, doing things like that made the highest, had sorry, made the biggest difference to student learning across all of the classrooms that Hattie and his team examined. Okay. The 1.28 is pretty abstract. If you don't know the book, you, you might want to look at it. Um, but this will matter huge in just a moment because we need to look at the way that the the way teaching literacy skills, specifically our transitional literacy skills, aligns perfectly with the cognitive development idea, which just makes sense. I mean, if we're thinking about reading, reading is the way we consume the thoughts of others in written word. We think about writing. Writing is the way we communicate our thoughts in writing, in the, using the written word. Uh, and so it shouldn't be much of a surprise that the reading strategies and um, things tied specifically to certain aspects of reading are directly affected by the developmental stages of the students. But it's important to point this out because if people are saying, well, I don't teach reading, I don't know how to teach reading, I'm not a literacy teacher, we can have a conversation of, I know you're not. That's right, you weren't trained for that, but here's why we need to consider it. So, lots of numbers, stay with me here. In the purple here, we have Piaget. And these are things you might remember from your ed psych days. Uh, if you took those, some ed psych classes in college or you, you know, went to graduate school or uh, you had to take that one ed psych class to become a teacher. Uh, you may remember some of this breakdown. And so we have the sensory motor, the pre-operational, the concrete operational, and the formal operational. And there's age overlap and things like that. But most middle and high school students are in the concrete and then the formal operational. And what triggers their movement from the concrete to the abstract is symbolic thought. So really it's as students start to understand abstraction, as they start to understand um, that not everything is concrete, they get more deeply in, sorry, they start transitioning into a more formal operational and abstract thinking. 
phase. So here we see Shawl's stages of reading development. Uh, I have that referenced in the, that's a, a pretty popular uh, way of thinking about the development of reading. I have that referenced on the works cited page. Um, most teaching involves initial reading and decoding, which we just talked about, uh, fluence, confirmation and fluency, reading for new learning, and then reading multiple viewpoints, reading and understanding multiple viewpoints, and then as adults, hopefully they are to the point where they're constructing and reconstructing meaning on their own. And then we think about what are often called the five stages of literacy development and see how those align age-wise here. Well, there's not perfect overlap, but you see the green box here is really where our transitional literacy happens. So as students are moving out of the initial literacy phase where they're recognizing all the phonological things, they are uh, they, they have banks of hundreds of sight words in their mind, if not more, um, and so on, they then start to move into these more operational and eventually more abstract phases of thinking. At the same time, they are developing or hopefully developing or have developed um, some fluency in their reading. And to Chris's question, uh, it says verbal fluency, not necessarily verbal fluency. Uh, verbal fluency is something that does matter, um, but verbal fluency is not emphasized as much as uh, flu accurate, accurate fluency of, of reading and comprehension. Um, but we do want to build towards accuracy and speed. Uh, but the verbal aspect can become problematic for different reasons. Um, and that's kind of a different discussion. Um, but it does help. Um, and then we see how that aligns with what is considered early literacy, but then we get into that transitional literacy phase here where there's actually a term called transitional literacy here with these five stages of development. So we're really focusing on this little bit smaller green box here when we think about middle and high school. But I went ahead and laid this out grade-wise so you all could see how some of the research is working as far as grades and students' ages go. And so we have the same things, Piaget, Chal, and the five stages we just looked at, and how they tend to align with grades and ages. So this blue line is really important because this blue line is really the difference between early literacy and the beginnings of transitional literacy, where students are using what they've learned in their early literacy phases to continue to read more complex texts, to continue to engage in more complex and comparative reading, and so on. Um, and it becomes our roles change significantly there, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But if you are in certain states, you may also recognize this blue line because there are many states who have what is called the third grade guarantee. Now, we're not going to get into whether or not that's a good idea or a bad idea, but research says different things about that. But the idea is that kids, lots of parents and lot, sorry, parents in some st several states are promised that their kids will be able to read in quotation marks by the end of third grade. And when they say that, that means the kids are going to be able to read grade level texts with decoding skills. They're going to have that fluency that we talked about just a moment ago. And they're going to be able to apply certain aspects of reading, phonological skill, sorry, phonological awareness, um, decoding, and so on, to read a text at grade level without help. So that's getting to that independence. That is not saying that they're going to be able to read a book or a text that would be assigned at eighth grade. But that also means that we just we cannot stop teaching literacy at third grade. So we get on into fourth and fifth here that is their own kind of box before we transition into the middle school and high school. So here we think about the reading rope and I've taken each strand of the reading rope and showed about where it is emphasized in schools. And you'll notice that those first three parts, decoding, phonological awareness and sight words they are emphasized, not surprisingly, in that pre-K through third grade 
second grade, third grade bit. Now, the parts that we are focusing on, language comprehension, the language comprehension strands are represented by these five bars down here. And you'll notice, yeah, they're introduced. I mean, sight words are in a way vocabulary, but students are also starting to learn vocabulary skills. Teachers are helping students begin building background knowledge skills and how to access background knowledge and so on from an early stage. But it continues on. These are the things that become increasingly strategic and we never stop teaching them as teachers and we hopefully never stop building on them as readers. Now we know not all of our students are going to be lifelong readers like we would like them to. We know not all of our students are going to read the things we ask them to read like we would like them to. But we can design instruction that targets these things in such a way that students get this get the exercises, sorry, get the practice with the exercises, and then we are asking to transfer those things to new texts. This green box is similar to the one on the previous one. This is where the teachers I'm talking to and talking about will be spending most of their time. And so we see, yeah, we're focusing on vocabulary, background knowledge, language structures, literacy knowledge, and verbal reasoning. And we're still continuing to think, okay, a lot of the kids that I'm working with in grades six through eight are, are still pretty concrete thinkers. They struggle with some of the abstraction. Uh, they may not get symbolic thought so much yet. Okay. They are good for reading for new learning or recognizing that they, they need to read something. Maybe they don't have as much knowledge about it. And so they can access background knowledge. Sure. But asking them to engage in multiple points of view, they may not be ready for that yet. So all of these things inform the activities and instruction that a teacher might design around these five things here. And we're going to see this in, in action here in just a moment. So if we're thinking just about those five things, and we're thinking just about the things that I had in that green box, grade six through 12. Now, let's think about how we might approach different things at different levels for students who are emerging, progressing, and accelerating or advancing. So here's an example for you. Background knowledge, we're thinking about that one strand. For students who are emerging, the teacher is going to predict, try to predict what kids would need to know about this and provide it so that the kids have the background knowledge they need to engage the text. They don't feel lost by the text. There's no feelings of, oh, this just isn't for me or I don't get this. Then as students build that automaticity, as they build more fluency and they trust themselves more, I can start releasing some of that. And so for the progressing students, the teacher is just going to guide them in identifying necessary background for comprehension. So it's could be it could be as simple as what do you need to Google about this? What don't you understand about what you just read? Let's Google it. Let's go find some information about it. Okay. And yeah, we could get into media literacy and stuff, but that's not the point right now. We want to think about yes, what do students need? How, sorry, how can I help students identify things that they don't know? And this could be so simple as the old school know, want to know, learn chart. Uh, it could be so simple as a close reading where students are putting a box or a question mark around something they don't, they don't know. Then as we start building students towards that strat, the, the independence, the strategic thinking and planning for their own reading, you think, okay, students recognize their own needs and how what they learn affects comprehension. So I don't have to say, hey, th this is talking about this one particular president. Do you know when that person was president? Do you know what they care? No. Here, the students say, what this is about, this is talking, keeps talking about this one thing. I don't know what that is. I need to Google it. So I'm not going to walk through all of these, but you see here that for each of those five aspects of the language comprehension strand, 
I'm laying out what a teacher might do for students who are emerging, progressing, and then accelerating and advancing. Now, a couple of key things as we, and we're gonna come back to this table a couple of times as we go through this. We need to remember, increasingly independent, automatic, and strategic. Here. We also need to remember, these go back and forth as students encounter more and more complex texts with increasingly complicated subject matter across the grade levels. So I may be working with a group of seventh grade students and I'm working with certain levels of text and I get them to where a, a high number of them are accelerating, they're more independent. Right? But when I start ramping up the text complexity, when I start pushing the grade levels of the texts, the uh, complex, the, the complications of the content that's being addressed, then students are going to probably need more support in these different ways. Right. Now, you see some of the things that I've put on here are things that, like I said earlier, teachers are already doing, okay? Teachers modeling using context clues. I don't know of a middle school teacher who doesn't do that or can't do that when he or she needs to. However, knowing, oh, most of my class is struggling with this, so I need to model it because they're still in this emerging phase. Getting them along through progressing, maybe to accelerating, but then when we start getting into more complex texts, when we start getting to those grade level texts where they absolutely need to be performing by the end of seventh grade, I like to remind people that a grade level text means that it is appropriate for that student in that grade level at the end of that grade level. All right, but we can get more into that later. Um, and there's different scales relating to different things, I know. Um, but And I have said this a thousand times already, but I want to remind you, and I think it's important that we remind all teachers that we're working with, likely you're already doing, should say, some of these things. You just may not have considered how they fit into the developmental development of literacy and cognitive skills and increasing independence. So let's practice this real quickly. I have a link here. I'm going to drop that link into the chat. When I teach my uh, Literacy for Teachers course or my, my um, uh, Literature for Teachers course, uh, we do things like this where we're practicing with different texts and we're looking at uh, literacy instruction. Um, and we use larger text, smaller text, and those, those teachers have to design activities uh, around the, their texts. If they're student teaching, they have to use a text that they're teaching in their student teaching, uh, just like what we're going to be looking at. So let me... Cycle over here as I open up this text. All right. If you choose to click on the link in the chat, great. If you choose to just follow along with what I'm doing, that is fine too. Uh, so you're going to see here I've got the same table that I just showed you on the slides a moment ago. And here I have a text. So if I go back to my presentation here, this is a text that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a text that used to be really common in middle school. Uh, it's appropriate grades, uh, ages 10 to 14, grades five through nine, you know, give or take. Um, and here's what I, the reason I like using this book. You know, this is an actual review uh, from a literacy website. Some say the book is good, is a good find for middle grade readers and younger teens. However, others say it's not for everyone and that readers should be comfortable with ambiguity, sophisticated vocabulary, and abstract thinking. And so students can read the book and get what's happening, but it will challenge them a little bit if they aren't comfortable with these things. And that's why it's such a good book. And books like this are such a good idea for um, middle grades readers and maybe early high school as well. So back to that text. Um, we have three paragraphs here is all I have as an excerpt from the book. And the way I ask students when they read, uh, the first time they read a text, I want them just marking it. I don't want them making notes. I don't want them writing any ideas or anything. I just want them marking the text because I don't want them to lose their train of thought. Uh, I'm going to read these three paragraphs right quick. 
And then we're going to talk about some of the different approaches that you see modeled here. Excerpt from The Mysterious Edge of the Heroic World by E.L. Koenig Konigsberg. When Amadeo was in fourth grade, the owner of a farm near his mother's hometown of Epiphany, New York, was draining a swamp and discovered a mastodon tusk sticking out of the ground. The farmer immediately cordoned off the area and invited scholars from nearby Clarion State University to help with the excavation. By the time they finished, they had uncovered the complete skeleton of a 15,000-year-old mastodon. With that discovery only 200 miles away, Amadeo wondered if any Ice Age wonders could be concealed beneath the skyscrapers of his hometown, New York City. And that is when he joined the Backyard Explorers, an after-school club. There were not many backyards to explore in his neighborhood, but his group went on field trips to the American Museum of Natural History twice a year. And in between, they learned about real backyard explorers. Some of the stories involved boys who were not much older than he was. There was a famous true story of a young Bedouin shepherd who followed a stray goat into a cave in the Judean desert, where he found clay jars filled with ancient writings that turned out to be copies of the Bible that had not been seen for 2,000 years. Those were the famous Dead Sea Scrolls. There was also the story of the four French boys who went for a walk one day and fell into a hole in the ground and found that the hole was opening to a cave that had walls covered with paintings not seen for 17,000 years. That hole was the famous Cave of Lascaux. To find mysterious writings would be even more wonderful than finding a mastodon tusk. But when Amadeo learned his mother was moving to Florida, moving them to Florida, he thought he would have to give up his dream. What chance was there of discovering something in a state that has in its geographic center a Disney-designated Discovery Island that is itself in the middle of a designated adventure land with a ticket booth at its entrance and a gift shop at its exit? What chance was there of discovering something in a state where every inch of real estate has been explored and or exploited or was soon to be purchased by his mother, for cell phone towers. All right. So you see, I've got a couple of things already marked in here. And I just have models, have examples of things that I might ask a student to do or ask the class to do if we're working through emerging, the emerging level of transitional literacy. So you notice a couple of things here. I have the background knowledge where I ask students to, you know, click on the links. So I'm giving the students the links and then asking them a question about those links. You know, how does this background knowledge affect what you're thinking? Uh, I have some things about vocabulary. You've noticed, you may have noticed that I footnoted the word mastodon. That also allowed me to not have to footnote ice age because I had, I had mastodon in the footnote. I like using footnotes in text like this because it teaches kids not to ignore footnotes because some teachers tell them, oh, you don't have to worry about the footnote. Just keep going. No, use the footnotes. I tell them vocabulary. Also, um, how could you comprehend the passage without knowing the black box words? This is teaching the strategy because we want them to become increasingly strategic. This is teaching the strategy that there are certain words I can black out. If I don't know it, I'm not going to get hung up on this word. You probably know, and lots of people know, but students still struggle with it, so they need to see it modeled. If you don't know every word on the page, but you still can figure out what's happening in the book, you're fine. And so having these in a black box is close to just marking them out completely. But students would still understand what was happening in the text. And it's one of those strategies that here where I'm providing it, I'm doing it for them, but then I'm asking them, how does this matter? So this is where they're emerging and so on. So, you know, language structures, I ask them to look at paragraph two, verbal reasoning. I ask them to think about um, what's happening in the text and then literacy knowledge. What do they know about genres? What do they know about uh, the way texts are put together? Uh, and I say, you know, this is a small part of a larger book. What do they think the book is about and so on? So these are some emerging tasks so when I think about what I'm doing as a teacher, I'm predicting and providing the background knowledge they may need. I am 
pointing to specific uses of languages and sentences. I am predicting what students need to know about a genre. What do they need to know about this, no about a novel? What do they need to know about stories and narratives in this case, with this story, with this excerpt? Right. Then the next example I have is progressing. So these would be the next steps. And, and you can I see lots of teachers who are doing differentiated instruction that looks identical to this. Or student teachers who ask a couple of questions that look like emerging, and then the next couple of questions look like they're more progressing. All right. But the whole idea here isn't necessarily that we're moving from a, a concrete comprehension to an abstract, like a lot of those questions are, and that's the way it, it should be done. Um, but that we're thinking about the teacher's role in this, in supporting, guiding, and then uh, releasing for the accelerating bit. And so you'll see the differences here in the, the emerging tasks. I asked them to click on the links and I said, you know, what do the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Cave of Lusco have in common? How does knowing what these things, knowing what these things are, help the way you help your comprehension of the text? Well, here I'm asking them, as you read, look for things you don't know but need to know. So they're having to identify them. I'm not predicting and identifying them anymore. Because hopefully they recognize, oh, I need to know, I probably need to know what the cave of Lasco and the Dead Sea Scrolls are. So they're going to go maybe and search for those things. They're going to be building towards that independent reading. Okay. What are one or two things you need to know? And I ask them to look them up. How does what you know about them affect what you know about the text and so on? So I'm not going to walk through all of these. I think you all get it. Okay. And as we talked, and if you've been coaching teachers for a while, you know it. Explain model, guided practice, independence, and influency. It's the same thing that we've talked about here when we talk about the emerging, progressing, and accelerating, but we're thinking about discrete literacy skills with this. So if we think just about accelerating now, what could be some next steps toward independence with this text that we've looked at? So students recognize their own needs and how what they learn affects comprehension. So where, as I ask them to find one or two things, they know how to do school. They're going to find those one or two things. And then I ask a question, you know, how do those things affect? Because I want them to know these things should affect. Well, now they're doing it on their own. Sorry, didn't mean to click. They're doing it on their own and so on. And so how do I map these things? How do I ask them to uh, keep track of these things? This is where I start supporting teachers and encouraging them to do reading logs, learning logs, as they read different novels, as they read different texts. I have a teacher that I work with who does uh, current events each week, uh, and she asks students to walk through current events questions like this, and she has aligned them to this specifically because she's teaching sophomores and some of those soft and she's teaching regular sophomores and some of those sophomores struggle to really understand certain aspects of a text. So this is where I was going to ask everybody uh, what this could look like in your class as we think about or what, what it does or could look like, because like I said, I know a lot of us are already doing these things or supporting teachers who are doing things like this. With a smaller group, I don't want to single out anybody. Um, you know, we may have time when it comes to questions uh, here in just a moment. Um, and I also like to think about this. Uh, yeah, but, um, you know, where could this go wrong? And then I, I often, when I have worked with some teachers, I ask them to share, you know, what comes to mind that you'd like to share? You know, do you have a story where you assumed the kids could do something, but they struggled to, uh, and it messed up the way you were teaching it. Did they have you? Do you have a story where uh, you made an assumption about kids and the way that they do vocabulary or the way that they read certain things? Um, and so it's important to get teachers talking about those things, because 
Teachers want to do well for their students. Inherently, they want to do well for their students. But also what I like to remind teachers of is the fact that most students, English teachers especially, most students aren't like you. And so they may not be thinking about text the way you have learned to think about text, however you learn that. So we need to constantly be modeling that and asking them to think about texts in a, in a way that might be different than they assume. So getting teachers to share those things is really important. Finally, before we move to questions, I said I would address uh, multi-tier systems of support. Um, and the headline tells it all here. Many think that reading instruction is only about remediation or special education in middle and secondary. And that is really not true at all. This table that is not mine, uh, it's uh, the sources cited in the in the um, the last slide has a nice breakdown of, of what tier one, you know, classroom interventions should look like as we're thinking about disciplinary literacy and content literacy. All right. And there we see specialized reading strategies. We see vocab and comprehension and, and also thinking about writing strategies versus what we might call basic literacy for the tier two and tier three interventions. And a lot of this is going to be reading specialists, but you as an English teacher need to be aware of these things too, because a lot more kids than you may think are going to need support in these ways. Right. Again, it doesn't mean that they weren't taught how to read. It doesn't mean that they didn't learn anything about how to read. They have a different perspective on reading and texts. They may be coming from a background where text they had no access to texts, they may be in a home situation that they were never read to, or that they don't have the opportunity to read or the time to read. And so keeping all of those things in mind matters. And then reminding everyone that you, as a quality teacher, matter. I'm going to read this quote from Chaw because I really think it helps hit home. I'll, I wanted to start with this, but I think it's good to end. Um, literacy can be seen as dependent on instruction with the corollary that quality of instruction is key. This view emphasizes the developmental nature of literacy, the passage of children through successive stages of literacy, in each of which the reading and writing tasks change qualitatively and the role of the instructor has to change accordingly. And so this is a fancy way, maybe a drawn out way of talking about the gradual release that we've looked at, the building towards automaticity and being more strategic. Okay. But I, I think it this does more in that it gives credit to the teacher as being a quality thinker, a quality leader, a quality teacher who's designing that instruction that scaffolds and builds and recognizes that their role changes too. All right. Shameless self-promotion for uh, my book here that Perfection Learning has, has supported. Um, and for our textbooks here, but those are really focused on AP. Uh, however, our blogs here are not just AP. I encourage you to check out the Next Steps blogs. I just uh, have a blog from this month about homework, and it is uh, not necessarily a popular opinion. I don't like homework. Uh, so you're welcome to check out the Perfection Next blogs here. Uh, we also have some other great contributors here for all ELA, not just advanced placement. And I like to remind everyone all the time, all the teachers I work with and everyone who attends my webinars that we are risk takers and mistake makers. We want our students to do that. Uh, we should be trying and doing that too. And uh, I always give a shout out to my friend Andy Schoenborn in Michigan uh, for giving me this phrase one day. All right, here's my contact information. I think you all know how to reach out to me, but uh, I'm gonna st I'll stick around if you have any questions. Uh, Ashley has put into the chat some links. So you've got the links there to the blogs that she's just given you. Uh, I also will tell you, it says, you see here in green, it says, please do the survey. You will receive an email. You might not get it tomorrow or Friday because Ashley just said, uh, Ashley's taking vacation, much deserved, Ashley, good for you. Um, and so you might not get it this week, you might get it next week, uh, but it's a one question survey that helps us determine uh, things that we will ask about 
no, sorry, other sessions that we'll have uh, regarding reading and ELA. And this is the first of a series of sessions that are focusing on ELA in general, not just advanced placement as I've been doing advanced placement work, but uh, my advanced placement sessions will continue as well. Please look for that at the end of this month. I'm doing one on uh, inspired by my friend, uh, Chris Judson, who sadly just dropped off the line but it's focusing on uh, rhetoric and empathy. So thanks so much, Ashley. Thanks everyone else. I'll stick around if you have any questions. Uh, you can come off mute or you can drop a question in the chat. Hope you're doing well. Please be in touch. All right, thank you, Brandon, for your insights this evening. Um, as a reminder, again, uh, we'll be sending that recording um, with Brandon's slide deck and the recording, uh, hopefully tomorrow, if not by Monday. Um, please consider subscribing to the blog, um, which is there in the chat, um, and remember to follow us on our social channels. Uh, so thank you, everybody. I uh, hope you have a great evening. Yes, thanks, everyone.